in this lecture. We shall discuss trial on indictment with the judge and jury in Ghana. Trial on indictment with the judge and jury in Ghana. In our previous lecture, we had indicated that by law there are some offenses that can be tried on indictments, and there are some offenses too that can be tried summary. Mentioned that for the offenses that can be tried on indictments, the procedure usually begins at the district courts because even though the actual trial of the accused person must take place at the high court, an accused person by law cannot be tried at the high court unless he has been previously committed to trial by the district courts. So in our previous discussion, we discussed trial on indictments and we indeed indicated the elaborate procedure we go through at the committal proceedings. So we discussed extensively what happens at the committal proceedings. And we completed the committal proceedings and we mentioned that at the end of the committal, the accused is committed to trial at the High Court. So that is the point that we have reached right now. That the accused person has been committed to trial at, at the High Court. That the accused has been committed to trial at the High Court. So what happens when the accused person appears in court after he has been committed to trial at the High Court? Now the first thing that we need to note is that there is something we refer to as direction for trial. Because remember, the accused has been already committed to trial by the district court. This is the first time that he's appeared at the high court for the trial on indictments. So that day when he appears before the court, the court is supposed to give his direction for trial. So what happens at this stage is that the accused person shall make his appearance and then Unless the court otherwise directs, the accused will be placed at the bar of the court unfettered. Unfettered, so you bring him there, no handcuffs, let him be there, unless the court otherwise directs. Then the bill of indictment is to be read to the accused and, if necessary, explained to him. Remember, we mentioned at the committal stage that the process that kickstarts this whole trial and indictment process is the committal proceeding. And it is kickstarted with a bill of indictment and a summary of evidence. And remember, at the committal stage, we mentioned that when we finish everything, everything has to be transmitted to the High Court with authenticated copies given to the Attorney General. So when we come here to at the High Court for the trial and indictment by judge and jury, the bill of indictment is to be read to the accused and, if necessary, explained to him. If there's any objection that an accused person or a lawyer has to the indictment or some of evidence, they can make the objection at this particular stage. If they have any application to also quash the indictment to that application shall be made at this stage. And it's after all these processes have been gone through, that is when the court shall finally give direction as to the time, the place, and the mode of the trial. So this is the first day that the accused is being brought to the High Court for the trial on indictment. And for that reason, the court must give its directions for the trial. So that is the procedure that you've just gone through. Of course, the accused must make his appearance on the day he is committed to appear before the trial court. 
unless the court otherwise directs him has placed the accused at the bar of the court unfettered, bring him there without handcuffs, read out the bill of indictment to the accused person, and also explain it to the accused person. If there's any objection to the indictment or summary of evidence to it may be raised at this stage. And the courts must give its direction as to the time, the place, and the mode of trial. All that I've said, you can see that under section 198 of the Act 30, and by virtue of its imports, I shall read out in extenso what section 198 of the Criminal and Other Offenses Procedure Act 1960 Act 30 says. It is headed direction for trial. And this is what it says, and I read. When the accused comes before the trial court in pursuance of the committal order, the procedure laid down in this section shall be followed. The court shall cause the bill of indictment to be read to the accused and, if necessary, explained to the accused. An objection by or on behalf of the accused person to the indictment or the summary of evidence shall then be taken. Subsection 4. The court may cause the indictment to be amended and new counts to be added unless it's of opinion and having regard to the merit of the case. The amendment cannot be made without injustice to the accused and may direct a supplementary summary of evidence to be delivered to the accused in the court. Subsection 5. The court may then require the accused to plead to the indictment or may postpone the taking of the plea to a later date that the court may direct. Subsection 6. The court shall then give directions as to the time, the place, and the mode of the trial. So this is what happens the first day when the accused appears before the High Court for the trial on indictments to begin. We must comply with what we call direction for trial. Remember, you have not been committed to trial, you've come from the district court, and this is the first time you're appearing at the High Court. So we must definitely receive the directions from the trial courts. And that is what, by way of an overview, we have mentioned that the accused must make his appearance. He must be placed at the bar, unfettered, read out the bill of indictment to him, and if necessary, explain it to him. If there's any objection to the indictment or some of evidence, it may be raised at this stage. And finally, the court shall give direction as to the time the place and the mode of trial. Remember, I've also mentioned that all of these, you can see them under section 198 of the Act 30. And for want of emphasis, I shall read again section 198 of Act 30. Pay critical attention to the subsections and what they say and give the idea about the directions for trial. Section 198. Subsection 1 of the Act 30 reads as follows. When the accused comes before the trial court in pursuance of the committal order, the procedure laid down in this section shall be followed. The court shall cause the bill of indictment to be read to the accused and, if necessary, explain to the accused. Subsection 3. An objection by or on behalf of the accused to the indictment or the summary of evidence shall then be taken. Subsection 4. The court may cause the indictment to be amended and new counts to be added unless it is of the opinion that having regard to the merits of the case, the amendment cannot be made without injustice to the accused, and may direct a supplementary summary of evidence to be delivered to the accused 
and the courts. Examination 5. The courts may then require the accused to plead to the indictment or may postpone the taking of the plea to a later date that the courts may direct. The court shall give directions as to the time, the place, and the mode of trial. That is section 198 of the Act 30 that deals with the directions for trial. Also take notes that still at that direction stage, section 234 of the Act 30 is important. Section 234 of the Act 30 indicates and deals with the question of the indictment. It says that where an indictment does not state and cannot by an authorized amendment be made to state an offense of which the accused can be convicted, it shall be quashed on the motion made before the accused pleads or on the motion in the arrest of judgment. In other words, there's an indictment which does not state, and we cannot even amend it to state an offense of which the accused can be convicted. Then, in that instance, the accused can make an application to quash the indictment before the accused is called upon to plead. Or it can be quashed on the motion in the arrest of judgment. Then section 234, subsection 2. A written statement of the motion shall be delivered to the registrar or other officer of the court by or on behalf of the accused and shall be entered on the record. So this is just by way of preliminary matters that we go through before the main trial itself begins. Remember section 198, that deals with the directions for trial. And the directions for trial stage, remember over there, the accused will be brought, placed at the court, the bar of the court unfettered, bill of indictment shall be read to the accused, and if necessary, explain to the accused, you may object to the indictment or summary of evidence. So this objection that you are seeing under section 198 of section 3, that I can object to the indictment, that is where now you are told under section 234, that the accused can actually bring an application to quash the indictment. Next is for us to look at the plea open to the accused person. Because once the accused is brought to the court on the trial of indictment, of course, we must make sure that we take the plea of the accused person. Remember, at the committal stage, we don't take the plea of the accused person because the court doesn't have jurisdiction at the committal stage. The district court does not have the jurisdiction to try the offense. So over there, we don't even take the plea of the accused person. So the plea of the accused person is taken at the high court. And what are the options available to the accused person? The accused can plead guilty. The accused can plead lack of jurisdiction of the courts, that the court doesn't have the jurisdiction to try the offense. The accused can plead or three for convict, can plead or three for acquit, and the accused can plead not guilty. What follows next in this discussion is to find out which provisions of the law give the accused the right to pick any of these pleas and also indicate the ramifications of each plea. So we shall begin with the plea of guilty. If the accused pleads guilty, what happens in that particular case? We are told under section 199 that when the accused pleads guilty to a charge, the court before accepting the plea shall if the accused is not represented by counsel, explain to the accused the nature of the charge and the procedure 
which follows the acceptance of the plea of guilty. And over there, remember, the accused may then withdraw the plea and then end up not pleading, not guilty. Any statement made by the accused in answer to the court shall be recorded by the court in writing and shall form a part of the court's proceedings. Section 199 of Section 4 deals with guilty with explanation. That if the accused pleads guilty but as words indicating that he may have a defense or so indicates in answer to the court, then the court shall enter a plea of not guilty and record it as having been entered by order of the court. So remember that where the accused pleads guilty, but he ends up adding words indicating to the court that the accused may have a defense or so indicates to the court so the explanation you give shows that you may have a defense then the court may rather enter a plea of not guilty for you so because of that when people are asked the options available to the accused person to plead in some books, you will see that the mention that the accused can plead guilty. You will see that the books will say not guilty, and they will also add guilty with explanation before they bring double jeopardy, and then they add autre de fois, uh, before and then they add lack of jurisdiction. So, the guilty explanation is what you see under section one nine nine, subsection four. We say that where the accused pleads guilty, but as words indicating that the accused may have a defense or so indicates an answer to the court, then the accused shall enter a plea of not guilty and record it as having been entered by order of the court. But take note of section 199, subsection 5 that the court shall not accept a plea of guilty in the case of an offence punishable by death. That the court shall not accept a plea of guilty in the case of an offence punishable by death. If you are arranged before the court for a child of murder, which by section 46 of the Act 29 carries the death penalty, even if you plead guilty, the court must not accept that plea of guilty. And as far as the plea of guilt is concerned, the case of Offair versus the State, reported in 1965, Ghana law reports Perolini as it then was, is very instructive. In that case, the learned justice indicated as follows, and I quote, the law is that a court must not take a defendant to have admitted his guilt unless he does so in unmistakable terms. The law is that a court must not take a defendant to have admitted his guilt unless he does so in unmistakable terms. That is the import of the case of Ofei, O-F-E-I, versus the state reported in 1965, Ghana Law Report, Olin uh, J. So, this one is very important, especially because of Section 199, Subsection 4, which says that where the accused pleads guilty, but adds words indicating that the accused may have a defense, then the court shall enter a plea of not guilty. So, even if I say I'm guilty, but I have an explanation, Showing that I have a defense. Remember the words of Ofer versus the states, the uh, Olenu J. Remember the words of Olenu J in Ofer versus the states, reported in 1965 Ghana Law Reports, where the learned justice held and as follows. And I read once again The law is that a court must not take a defendant to have admitted his guilt unless he does so in unmistakable terms. So if I plead guilty, I had an explanation, and the explanation is inconsistent with the plea of guilty. As a court, you must record a verdict of not guilty, a plea of not guilty for me. 
What if the court refuses to enter a plea of guilty? A plea of not guilty. For example, remember we've mentioned that the court shall not accept a plea of guilty in the case of an offence punishable by death. So what if I plead guilty to the offence of murder and the court accepts the plea of guilty and proceeds to now sentence me to death? In other words, the court refuses to alter the plea and ends up convicting me accordingly. The answer to this question is in section 199, subsection 6. Now, where the court decides not to alter the plea, the Supreme Court shall have the right on appeal against conviction to order a retrial in the Supreme Court's of the opinion that a plea of not guilty should have been entered by the trial court. Again, where the court decides not to alter the plea, the Supreme Court shall have the rights on appeal against conviction to order a retrial if the Supreme Court is of the opinion that a plea of not guilty should have been entered by the trial court. Remember that under section 239, a plea of guilty once it is recorded shall constitute a conviction. So it's not a plea when you plead it, it is only when it is recorded by the court. That is when the plea of guilty shall constitute a conviction. There's an interesting provision in our law that deals with pleading, pleading guilty to a lesser offense. It has been described to some others as plea bargain. Pleading guilty to a lesser offense. So you've been charged with an offense like murder, which is higher and severer in gravity than an offense of manslaughter. Sometimes an accused person may want to plead guilty to a lesser offense. If you look at section 239, subsection 2 of the Act 30, it reads as follows, and I quote, where an accused is arraigned on an indictment for an offense, and can lawfully be convicted on the indictment of any other offence, not charged in the indictment. The accused may plead not guilty of the offence charged in the indictment, but guilty of the other offence. Please take a critical look at this section once again. Section 239, subsection 2 of the Act 30. Where an accused is arraigned on an, on an indictment for an offence and can lawfully be convicted on the indictment of any other offence which is not charged in the indictment. So the indictment states murder. But you can lawfully be convicted also of manslaughter which is not in the indictment. The accused can plead not guilty to the offence charged in the indictment, meaning you can plead not guilty to the murder, but you can proceed to plead guilty to that offence, which is the man slaughter. So where an accused is arraigned on an indictment for an offence and can lawfully be convicted on the indictment of any other offence which is not stated in the indictment. So the indictment states murder. You can plead not guilty to the murder, but plead guilty to any other offence like manslaughter. I shall demonstrate this to you and it shall become clearer if we look at the case of Republic versus Director of Prisons, ex parte or Henry Jan, which is reported in 1979 Ghana Law Report at page 396. This is what transpired in that particular case. Republic versus Director of Prisons, ex parte or Hene Jan. Or Hene is O H E N E and then a hyphen and Jan, D J A N. Republic versus Director of Prisons, ex parte or Hene Jan.
reported in 1979, Ghana law reports ASPE 396. This is what transpired in that case, and I'm reading the brief facts from the head notes. Remember the case of the public versus director of prisons, ex parte or Hinejan, reported in 1979, Ghana law reports at page 396. These are the brief facts. At his trial for murder before a jury, the applicant threw his counsel at the close of the case for the prosecution. informed the court that he wished to avail himself of section 239 subsection 2. At this point, may I go back to read what section 239 subsection 2 says to you. That where an accused is arranged on an indictment for an offence and can lawfully be convicted on the indictment of any other offence not charged in the indictment. The accused may plead not guilty to the offence charged in the indictment, but plead guilty of the other offence. So remember the example I gave you, that the indictment states murder, you may want to plead not guilty to the murder and plead guilty to manslaughter, even though manslaughter has not been stated in the indictment. So that is the import of section 239, subsection 2 of the Act 30. Now, where an accused is arranged on an indictment for an offence and can lawfully be convicted on the indictment of any other offence not charged in the indictment, the accused may plead not guilty of the offence charged in the indictment, but guilty of the other offence. And I want to demonstrate this with the case of Republic versus Director of Prisons, Expert or Henry Jan, reported in 1979, Ghana Law Report at page 396. These are the brief facts of the case. At his trial for murder before a jury, the applicant to his counsel at the close of the case for the prosecution informed the court that he wished to avail himself of Act 30, Section 239, Subsection 2, by pleading not guilty of murder, but guilty of manslaughter. The trial judge consulted the prosecution which gave its consent, whereupon a child of murder was read to the applicant who pleaded not guilty of murder, but guilty of manslaughter. The court then proceeded to convict the applicant on his plea of guilty of manslaughter and acquitted him of murder. The applicant did not appeal But after the time limited for appeal had expired, he brought this application under the Habeas Corpus Act of 1964, Act 244, for his release on the ground that his trial was ex facie irregular. Since A, at 30 of specifically section 239 of section 2, could not be invoked at the stage the trial had reached. Because he's saying that at that particular stage, the trial had gone far and then the prosecution had closed their case. So this same person who raised the argument that he wants to avail himself of Section 239 Section 2 by pleading not guilty to the offense of murder, but guilty of manslaughter, this same person who made this plea was convicted. This same person has brought this application saying that the trial was irregular because section 239 and section 2 could not be invoked at the stage that the trial had reached and that the court ought to have first acquitted the applicant of the offence of murder before convicting him of manslaughter and also that once the applicant was put in charge of the jury he could not in law be acquitted or convicted except by verdict of the jury which was not taken in this case. Let me summarize the grounds under which the application for the habeas corpus has been brought. Remember, this applicant is the same person 
who at the close of the prosecution's case informed the court that he wishes to avail himself of the provision in section 239 of section 2 by pleading guilty of the murder stated in the indictment. Pleading not guilty to the murder stated in the indictment and rather pleading guilty for manslaughter. This same person, after this was done, this person didn't appeal again the decision. But after the time for appeal had expired, he brought an application for habeas corpus on three grounds. The first ground is that by virtue of the state that the trial had reached, which is that the prosecution had closed their case, then according to him, section 239 of section 2, which gives the accused the permission to plead guilty to a charge not in the indictment, according to him, section 239 of section 2 could not be invoked. Before I proceed, let us read section 239 of section 2 again and let us see whether it gives any timeline. 239 of section 2 says that when an accused is arraigned on an indictment for an offense and can lawfully be convicted on the indictment of any other offense not charged in the indictment, the accused may plead not guilty of the offense charged in the indictment, but guilty of the other offense. And I'm on the case of Republic vs. Director of Prisons, expert Tohine reported in 1979, Ghana Law Report at page 396. So the application of the applicant was brought on three grounds. First one was that he could not invoke section 239 of section 2 at that stage that the trial had reached, because in this case, the prosecution had closed their case. Second ground was that the court ought to have acquitted the applicant first on the offense of murder before convicting him of manslaughter. So his, the second argument is that since he was charged for murder and he pleaded not guilty of murder, the court first of all ought to have acquitted him of the offense of murder before proceeding to now convict him of the offense of manslaughter. So, they are saying that the court first should have acquitted him of the murder because that's why he was there. So you can't say that you didn't acquit him of the murder by convicting him of manslaughter. That was the second ground of the application for habeas corpus. The third ground for the application was that in a trial of indictment by judge and jury, the accused is in the hands of the jurors. So if the accused is in the hands of the jury, then even if he pleads guilty, it must be the ju jury that will determine whether he's guilty or not. But if he was put in charge of the jury, the accused is saying that even when he pleads guilty, the judge could not have acquitted him, except by the verdict of the jury, which was not taken in this case. What do you think about these basis? Because the trial on indictment and the ultimate verdict in the trial of indictment must come from the jury. In this case, the jury they have not brought any verdict, but the judge is the one who convicted the appellant. It was held by the court dismissing the application. Now, one, there was no irregularity about the invocation of section 239, subsection 2, at the stage that the trial had reached. According to the court, as long as the child was re-read to the accused and he was asked for and made his plea, the subsection had been complied with by the court. What the court is saying in this holding one is that you can invoke section 239 of section 2 even if the prosecution has closed their case, so long as the child can be re-read to you and then you can plead. Holding two. On a strict interpretation of section 239 of section 2, an accused ought to have been acquitted for the charge of murder before being convicted of the offense of manslaughter. That's on a strict interpretation of section 239 of section 2. The accused ought to first have been acquitted of the charge of murder before being convicted of the offense of manslaughter. I mean that the court is agreeing with the accused that 
because he pleaded not guilty to the murder. Strictly speaking, he ought to have been first acquitted on the charge of murder before being convicted of the offense of manslaughter. So the court is agreeing with him. But the court added. However, by CA4, section 16, deviations from forms prescribed in an enactment which did not materially affect the substance did not vitiate the form use. That the instant deviation was not material and did not vitiate the conviction. So one thing that you should bear in mind is that the reason we looked at this case was because we were examining the plea of guilty by an accused person. So do not lose track. We are saying that the accused person has been arraigned before the trial court or the trial of indictment and the accused person decided to explore the plea of guilty but this time around the accused was pleading guilty to another offense that was not mentioned in the indictment and we mentioned that the accused can be convicted of the other offense and then be acquitted of the offense named in the indictment that's the reason why we are examining case of Republic versus Director of Prisons, Ex-Party or Himijan. So that is the second option available to the accused person that is pleading guilty to a lesser offense. But what if the accused person refuses to plead at all? You bring the accused before the trial high courts on the charge of indictment and the accused person refuses to plead. What happened? Section 238 of Act 30 is instructive on this point. Section 238 of Act 30 provides as follows, and I read. Where an accused who is arraigned on or charged with an indictment stands mute of malice, of neither will, nor by reason of infirmity, can answer directly to the indictment the court may cause a plea of not guilty to be entered on behalf of the accused. So where an accused who is arraigned on or charged with an indictment stands mute of malice, of neither will, nor by reason of infirmity can answer directly to the indictment, the court may cause a plea of not guilty to be entered on behalf of the accused. Subsection 2. A plea of not guilty entered on behalf of the accused shall have the same effects as if the accused had so pleaded, or else the court shall proceed to try the accused, or where the case is traveled by jury. Section 242 or 245. Cause a jury to be empaneled to try whether the accused is of a sound or unsound mind. In other words, when an accused person pleads not refuses to plead at all and keeps quiet, so they ask you the accused, are you guilty or not guilty? And then he is silent. The court may cause a plea of not guilty to be entered on behalf of the accused person. And a plea of not guilty entered on behalf of the accused shall have the same effect as if it was the accused who pleaded not guilty. Otherwise, the court will have to proceed to try the accused or cause the jury to be empaneled to try whether the accused is of a sound or unsound mind. And that's important. Because why would we ask you to plead and you stand there quietly looking at our faces without saying anything? It means that we must try and find out whether you are a person of a sound mind or unsound mind and are just playing with the courts. Mm -hmm. When the accused is found to be of sound mind, section 238, subsection 3 is very instructive. It provides that where the accused is found to be of sound mind, the court shall proceed with the trial. That's section 238, subsection 3, where you have Ask you to plead and you have kept quiet and you haven't said anything and we try here we find you that you're of sound mind the court shall proceed with the trial it means that you're just playing with us 
My word accused the found to be of unsound mind. The court shall proceed in the manner as set out in section 133 of Act 30. Again, again, section 238, subsection 4 says that where the accused is found to be of unsound mind, the court shall proceed in the manner provided by section 133 of Act 30. 133 of Act 30, if you check it, it deals with inquiry as to the lunacy of the accused person. And that will be dealt with in a separate lecture. So refusal of the accused to plead. When the accused is a person who refuses to plead, the law says that we shall record a plea of not guilty. We shall inquire into whether the accused is of sound or unsound mind. And if we find the accused to be of sound mind, the court shall proceed with the trial. But when the accused is found to be of unsound mind, the court shall proceed in the manner provided in section 133 of the Act, which means the court shall inquire as to the lunacy of the accused person under section 133 of the Act. So that is what happens when the accused decides to plead, to refuse to plead. Now what if the accused decides to expressly plead not guilty? That's under section 236 of Act 30. And this is the one that will form the main subject of our discussion for today. For many a time, the accused will plead not guilty. So section 236 of Act 30, which is very important, reads as follows. And I'm reading from section 236 of Act 30. And it reads as follows. Plea of not guilty. An accused on being arranged on an indictment. By pleading not guilty, generally to the indictment, places the onus on the prosecution to establish the guilt of the accused. Again, an accused on being arraigned on an indictment, by pleading not guilty, generally to the indictment, places the onus on the prosecution to establish the guilt of the accused. So this section 236 of the Act 30 is very important. It reads as follows, and I read once again. An accused on being arraigned on an indictment by pleading not guilty generally to the indictment places the onus on the prosecution to establish the guilt of the accused. In other words, once an accused person pleads not guilty, then the onus is now on the prosecution to establish the guilt of the accused. Remember that under Article 19 of the Constitution, the accused is presumed to be innocent until the accused is proven guilty. So if the accused is presumed to be innocent and he says, I am not guilty to the indictment, then the burden is on you, the prosecution, to now establish the guilt of the accused person. So what then follows after a plea of not guilty? And this is where the main trial on indictment begins from. Section 240 of the Act 30 is very instructive. It provides for the proceedings that follow after a plea of not guilty is entered. Section 240 of the Act 30 reads as follows, and I quote, Where the accused pleads not guilty, or if a plea of not guilty is entered, the court shall proceed to choose jurors or assessors as directed to try the case. Now take a critical look at this section 240 subsection 1. That where the accused pleads not guilty, or if a plea of not guilty is entered, the court shall proceed to choose jurors or assessors as directed to try the case. In other words, 
Remember that you mentioned that when you plead not guilty, the burden is on the prosecution to establish the guilt of the accused. So if the burden is on the prosecution, what is the procedure that has to be followed to establish the guilt of the accused? The law is saying under section 240 that where the accused pleads not guilty, or if a plea of not guilty is entered, then the court must proceed to choose the jurors that have to try the case. It means that we are now beginning with the trial. But there is an important point I have to make at this at this stage. And the language of Article Section 240 is that once the accused person pleads not guilty, then the court shall proceed to choose jurors or assessors as the right to try the case. There has been a controversy and an ongoing discussion on whether when the accused pleads not guilty, the court is supposed to order the prosecution to file their disclosures and conduct the case management conference before the jurors are impaneled. Some people have argued that because the conduct of case management conference is something that is supposed to be done, it can be done by the judge alone. So some people have argued that once the accused person pleads not guilty, then the court is supposed to order the prosecution to file their disclosures, and then the case management conference will be conducted before the jurors would be empaneled. Another school of thought has argued that no, section 240 is very clear, that once the accused is not guilty, then the court shall proceed to choose jurors or assessors as the either to try the case. So the other school of thought has maintained that once the accused is not guilty, then the court must proceed to choose the jurors to try the case. And after you've chosen the jurors, you shall now order the disclosures to be filed before you conduct the case management conference. So there's, there's this ongoing discussion. When accused is not guilty, do we just go ahead and empanel the jury? Or we go ahead and order the prosecution to file their disclosures, conduct case management conference before we empanel the jury? I have a position, and my position has been provided for in the practice direction on disclosures and case management and criminal proceedings, and I'm showing on the screen now, it's been published on the Thursday, 22nd of November, 2018, and it has a provision on what is supposed to be done. If you look at page 12 of this part of the direction, and then over there you see a heading application of this direction. Look at that paragraph 6 and look at the paragraph 3 and another paragraph 6. It reads as follows, and I quote, In trials on indictment, the court shall choose jurors or assessors before adjourning the case for case management conference. In trials on indictment, the court shall choose jurors or assessors before adjourning the case for case management conference. So you see, the practice direction is that in trials on indictment, the court must proceed to choose the jurors or the assessors before the court considers and conducts the case management conference. So supported by this provision, it means that once the accused pleads not guilty to the offense, then the court must proceed to empanel the jurors. Once you empanel the jurors, then you can order the disclosure to be filed before the case management, before the case adjourned for the conduct of case management conference. My position is supported by the practice direction on case on disclosures and case management in criminal proceedings. Specifically, if you look at the last but I'm getting to the end of the pages. You see application of this direction. And the subparagraph 3 says, In trials on indictment, the court shall choose jurors or assessors before adjourning the case 
for case management conference. So we have explained the procedure that is following after the plea of not guilty is ended. And like I said, that is when the main procedure starts from. When you plead not guilty, then the court must proceed to empanel the jurors. And now we've been told in the practice direction that before the court will adjourn for case management conference, the jurors must be empaneled. So when the jurors are empaneled, what do we do next? It means the trial must begin. So look at what section 241 of the Act 30 says. It reads as follows, and I quote, and remember at this point, we have empaneled our, ju our jury. So it says that, where from the absence of witnesses or any other reasonable cause to be recorded in the proceedings, the court considers it necessary or advisable to postpone the commencement of or to adjourn a trial. The court may postpone or adjourn it on the term that it considers fit, for the time that it considers reasonable, and may by warrant remand the accused to a prison or any other place of security. So we've been told that the court will have to empanel the jurors before adjourning for case management conference. So we empanel the jury, we adjourn for case management conference. After case management conference, we have to adjourn for the trial to begin. We are adjourned for the trial to begin. The court is saying that, the law is saying under section 241, where from the absence of witnesses, because at this time we've already gone to conduct our case management conference and we are back for the trial to begin. Where from the absence of witnesses or any other reasonable cause to be recorded in the proceedings, the court considers it necessary or advisable to postpone the commencement of or to adjourn a trial. The court may postpone or adjourn it on the term that it considers fit and may by warrant remand the accused person to a prison or any other place of security. So while the accused person is on remand, what happens? The law says that during a remand, that is section 2, for this section 2, the courts may at any time order the accused to be brought before the court. As section 240, section 3 says that the court may on the remand admit the accused person to bail. So now, take note of these provisions and all the section 244 of Act 30. Because now you are saying that when the accused person pleads not guilty, the court must proceed to empanel the jury. And you've been told from the practice direction that before you adjourn for the case management conference, make sure you have empaneled your jury. Now, if you have empaneled your jury, what is even the composition of the jury? Let's even deal with the composition of the jury. How should we even compose the jury? Section 244 of that 30 is very instructive. It says that in cases trial with a jury, the trial shall be with a jury of seven persons. So the law gives us the number of persons who can be jurors. It must be seven people. Seven people. It must be an odd number. Seven persons are the persons that would have to compose of the jury. Section 244, you do not have to forget this. Composition of the jury. In cases trouble with the jury, the trial shall be with a jury of seven persons. Then section 205 of Act 30 deals with the qualification of the jurors. Who are the categories of persons who are qualified to be jurors? The law says that subject to sections 207 and 208, a person between the ages of 25 and 60 years who is resident in the Republic and can understand the English language is liable to serve as a juror. A person between the ages of 25 years And 60 years, who is resident in the Republic and can understand the English language, is 
is liable to serve as a juror. So take note of the composition of the jury under section 244. In cases trouble with a jury, the trial shall be with a jury of seven persons. And then what is the qualification? The subject to section 207 and 208, a person between the ages of 25 and 60 years who is resident in the Republic and can understand the English language is liable to serve as a juror. So it's important that you note who is qualified to be a juror in Ghana, a person between the age of 25 and 60 years, and must be resident in the Republic and must understand the English language. But remember, the session says that, section 205, it says that subject to section 207 and 208, a person between the ages of 25 and 60 years who is resident in the Republic and can understand the English language is liable to serve as a duo, meaning that there are some exceptions. So who are the people that are exempted from serving as duos? Is it anybody at all who is within 25 and 60 years? and residents in the Republic and can understand the English language? Can judges serve as jurors? Can the president be a juror? Can practicing lawyers be ju jurors? What does the law say? So some people are exempted from serving as jurors. And the exemptions are in section 207 of the Act 30. That is why section 207 of the Act 30 is there. That is why Section 205 says that subject to Section 207 and 208, a person between the ages of 25 and 60 years who is resident in the Republic and can understand the English language is liable to serve as a duo. So we must look at the people that are exempted from duos. And Section 207 is very instructive. What are they saying? that the following persons are exempt from liability to serve as jurors. And then we are able to list the persons. A, the president, vice president, speaker, and members of parliament. So the president, the vice, speaker, and members of parliament, A. And then B, justices of the superior court of judicature the judges and magistrates of the lower courts, coroners and deputy coroners, they are also exempted. C, legal practitioners in actual practice and other court offices, they are also exempted. D, registered medical practitioners and registered dentists in actual practice, they are also exempted. E, registered pharmacists in actual practice, they are also exempted. F, prison officers and warders, they are also exempted. G, police officers, they are also exempted from liability to serve as jurors. H, officers and other members of the armed forces on full pay they are also exempted. I, public officers, other than those engaged on clerical duties, employed in the medical posts and telecommunications, customs, excise and preventive service, or under the Ghana Ports and Harbors Authority, they are also exempted. J, persons actually officiating as priests or ministers of their respective religions, they are also exempted by Section 207 of the Act 30. K. Schoolmasters actually engaged in teaching in a school. They are also exempted. L. Persons 
employed in a public electric telegraph office or in an electric power station. They are also exempted. M, a diplomatic and consular representative and the salaried functionaries of government or foreign government. They are also exempted. O, editors of daily newspapers. They are also exempted. And MP, any other persons exempted by the Chief Justice. They are also exempted. So the Chief Justice has the power to also exempt some people. So what I want you to take note of is this. That in Ghana, when you are trying an offense by indictment, the trial on indictment can be by a judge and a jury. But many people have asked, what is the composition of the jury? Section 244 of the authority has the answer that the jury must be a people of seven persons. And they are people that can qualify to serve as jurors. Seven people. That is the composition of the jury. But what is the qualification of the jurors? Section 205 of Act 30 is there. A person between the ages of 25 and 60 years who is resident in the Republic and can understand the English language is liable to serve as a juror. So we also have the qualification of the jurors. The person must be between 25 and 60 years and must be resident in the Republic and must be able to understand the English language. You are liable to serve as a juror. But the Act says subject to Section 207 and 208. So what do we have from Section 207? The people who are exempted from serving as jurors in Ghana, Section 207 of Act 30. And it lists the categories of persons. And I've listed all of them already. So that is the import of Section 207. It tells us the people that are exempted to serve as jurors in Ghana. What does 208 as well say? 208 says that a person convicted of treason or felony or an offense involving dishonesty, unless that person has obtained a free pardon, is not qualified to serve as a jurors. So it means that people that have been convicted of a treason felony or of an offense involving dishonesty, unless that person has obtained a free pardon, he is also not qualified to serve as a juror. So when Section 205 was dealing with the qualification of jurors, it says subject to Section 207 and 208 of the Act 30, a person between the ages of 25 and 60 years who is resident in the Republic and can understand the English language is liable to serve as a juror even though the Act mentions that it gives some exceptions. So the exceptions are in section 207 and 208. 207 gives us the people who are exempt from liability to serve as jurors. And then 208 shows us the people that are also disqualified from serving as jurors. That if you have been convicted of a treason or felony or an offense involving dishonesty, then if you have not obtained a free pardon, they are not qualified to serve as a jury. So this is the composition of the jury in Ghana. These are the people who are qualified to be jurors in Ghana. And these are the people too that are also what, disqualified from serving as jurors in Ghana. And you must take note of this particular provision. So that is the import of section 205. That deals with the qualification of jurors. And please remember that under section 244, the jury must be composed of seven persons under section 244. And under 205, the qualification, it must be a person between 25 and 60 years who is resident in the Republic and can understand the English language. He is able to serve as a juror. Remember under 207, the people are exempt from liability from serving as jurors. And remember under section 208, some people are also disqualified from serving as jurors. So that is for the composition of the jury and the qualification of persons who can serve as jurors. The next thing is to discuss 
how do we even select the people to try to serve as Jews? How do we even select them in Ghana? How do we even select the people who serve as Jews in Ghana? Section 246 of the authority is instructive on this. That it is headed names of jurors to be drawn from ballot boxes. So this is how we are now come to select the jury. Can we just go and appoint any person at all to serve as a jury on a particular case? How do we appoint the jury? Section 246 of the authority is instructive, and this is what it says. At the sitting of the court to try criminal cases, tribal by jury, the names of the jurors summoned shall be written on separate pieces of paper or certain pieces of card or paper of equal size and put in the box. Again, at the sitting of the court to try cases traveled by jury, the names of the jurors summoned shall be written on separate pieces of card or paper of equal size and put into a box. Where a jury is required, the registrar or other officer of the court shall in open court draw from the box by lot until the required number of jurors appear. Let me explain this process. It means that on the day in question, if a case is supposed to be tried on indictment, then there is supposed to be a box that will have cards of equal size and the names of the jurors would be in the box of equal size because we don't want to make it look like when you see a big paper you know that this is Kwame in this one so I'm selecting him equal size so you don't know who you're even selecting so the register will just come put it down into the box take one measure your name and you're going to sit down take one measure your name you're going to sit down take one measure your name you're going to sit down so the names of the jurors will be drawn from the ballot boxes until the required number of jurors appear and it shall be done in open court. So the accused person will be there and the box will be there. And then the registrar or other officer of the court shall in open court put his hand into the box. Mention, Ama, Bosu, you're going to sit there. Kwame, Mensa, you're going to sit there. And that is how we keep on mentioning one after the other until we get the full number of seven people to serve as jurors. Then section 246 subsection 3 says that after just cause or challenge is allowed, those who remain as fair and indifferent shall constitute the jury for the trial. This provision of section 246 subsection 3 is very important. It says, after just cause of challenge is allowed, those who remain as fair and indifferent shall constitute the jury for the trial. What does this mean? It means that as we are appointing the jury, there can be a challenge. Because when you mention Kwesi Mensah, and I think Kwesi Mensah is going to be biased, I have a right to challenge as an accused person. So there are different ways of challenging when you are impaneling the jury. There are different ways of challenging when you are impaneling the jury. So, one provision that you are supposed to look at is what you call the peremptory challenge under section 250 of the Act. This preemptory challenge is that when the register calls one person, Amabosu, you go and sit down. I, the accused person can say, I don't like Amabosu. And he's not required to give any reason for the challenge. That's one. The moment he challenges the jury, you must go and sit down. You are not part anymore. The accused person is given a maximum of three chances that he can object to a person to serve as a juror without even assigning any reason. We call this a preemptive challenge. So in an offense trouble on indictment, Remember, we said that the jury in Ghana is made up of seven people. Remember, we've mentioned that these seven people, they are supposed to be selected from a box. The register will come, 
if there will be cards of equal sizes, you will select one, two, three. You will keep on calling your names until you get seven. If you mention a name, and sometimes you can see that it may be invested in the rape offense. Sometimes you can impanel a jury, and it can be a woman. That the woman is a fair person. That he does not have any problem with the woman. But he's just thinking that, well, maybe if it's a woman, he might, she might be emotional and she might rule against me. He can say, I don't want this woman to be part. You don't even have to give a reason. The court will remove the person from there. It is called a peremptory challenge. And it's provided for under section 250 of the Act 30. It reads as follows. There shall not be a challenge to the array, but an accused, personally or by counsel, shall be allowed to challenge three of the jurors by way of peremptory challenge without assigning a cause. End of quote. So when we hear of peremptory challenge in Ghana, what we actually mean is that an accused person, when you are impaling the jury, can just say that I do not want this person to be part of the jury, and that person will be taken out. It is called peremptory challenge, and it is provided for under Section 250 of the Act 30. But what if beyond the three people, you want to still object to somebody to be part of the jury, and you have a justifiable reason that this person is related to the victim, He's related to one of the parties, and so he's likely to be biased. And that's a very serious consideration. But if I'm an accused person, and I've called somebody to be a member of the jury, and that person is related to the victim who has been raped, or the victim who has been killed, I have a legitimate reason to object. Remember, by this time, you have already exhausted your three. Beyond the challenge. If it is beyond the three, and you still want to object, we call it a challenge for cause. So, Section 251 of the Act 30 provides for a challenge for cause, and this is what it says. Challenge for cause shall be allowed on any of the following grounds. So, those one, if you are going under a challenge for cause, you must give the grounds under which you are coming for that challenge. It says as follows, and I quote, Section 251 of Act 30. Challenge just for cause shall be allowed on any of the following grounds. A. A presumed or actual partiality or prejudice in the duo. A standing in the relation of a husband, wife, master or servant, landlord or tenant to the accused. Or to a person supposed to have been injured or affected by the acts complained of. So you see what Section 201 is saying. That if you are going to bring a challenge for cause, it shall be allowed if you can show that there's a presumed or actual partiality in the duo, a standing in relation to the husband, a wife, a master or servant, landlord or tenant. And that person is a wife of the accused, master of the accused, or master of the person who has been injured. Like I said, the one who has been raped or the one who has been killed, who has been killed, you can object. And it's a, it's a grounds under which the court will allow that challenge for cause. Again, challenge for cause shall be allowed when there's a presumed or actual partiality or prejudice in the juror, a standing in relation to the or relation of husband, wife, master, or servant, none of the tenant, to the person on whose complaint the prosecution was instituted, to the complainant. You are the wife of the complainant. You are the husband of the complainant. You are the master of the complainant. This one, it means that you are likely to be biased. I can object. And once I object and I show that you have a relationship with the complainant, you are supposed to be taken out of the whole members of the jury. Or, look at the ivy. That to a person who is in the employment of a person, who is a plaintiff or defendant, against any other person in a civil suit or having complained against or having been accused by a person in a criminal prosecution of entertaining or entertaining prejudicial views on the case to be tried. So you're a person and you're entertaining prejudicial views on the case to be tried. You, before you even come 
to the court and they are calling as a jury. I've seen you on radio. That you have views against me already. That I'm a bad person. As for me, I must go to prison. And you are in the court. And they have called you to be a member of the jury. Challenge for cause under section 251. I can object and you'll be taken out of the members of the jury. Challenge for cause. 251 also says that a challenge for cause can also be allowed on the following grounds. 251B, that a personal cause of infancy, old age, deafness, blindness, infirmity, or ill health. You are an infant. You are of old age. You are deaf. You can't hear the proceedings. You are visually impaired. So you can't see the demeanor of the witnesses when they are even lying. Or you are infirm. Or you are seriously ill. As an accused person, I can object to you being a member of the jury. It is a challenge for cause. Or a challenge for cause also can be allowed on the basis that the juror has been convicted for perjury or any other offense disqualifying the juror. So remember, we've already dealt with grounds under which a person can be disqualified from serving as a juror. When you be convicted of treason, on offense involving dishonesty, and you have not received a pardon. So, under section 251, when the juror has been convicted of a perjury or for any other offense that is disqualifying the juror, the law says that I can object when you call that person to serve as a juror. And when I object and I challenge for cause, it's one of the grounds that this man has been convicted of perjury, of lying under oath, he's not qualified to serve as a juror. Or if a Jew also does not understand the English language, he's also not qualified to serve as a Jew. So please take note of this, that there's something we call preemptive challenge. When the Jew are being mentioned, the accused can object to a maximum of three without assigning any reason. It is called preemptive challenge. And that one, you don't have to give any reason. You can say, I don't even like the way he even looks. Take him out. The court will take the person out. It's called a preemptive challenge. And at section 250, there shall not be a challenge to the array, but an accused personally or by counsel shall be allowed to challenge three of the jurors by way of preemptive challenge without assigning a cause. And challenge for cause, it shall be allowed on any of the following grounds. So if you are coming under challenge for cause, that one you must give a basis. And the grounds have been mentioned under section 251. When you have a prejudice against the accused person, you are the wife of the accused person, you are the wife of a person affected by the offense child over there, you are also likely to be partial because you have made prejudicial views on the case to be tried. Or you are a person who is an infant, you have old age, you are deaf, you are blind, you are seriously ill, I can object that you should be taken out. Or you are a person that has been convicted of perjury, or of any other offense disqualifying the Jew, I can object that you should be taken out. Or if the Jew does not understand the English language, I can object that you should be taken out. So, look at section 252 of that 30. It deals with the trial of a challenge for cause, because if I object and I give a reason, this was section 252 of that 30 says, a challenge for cause, if objected to by the opposite party, shall be tried and determined by the court without a jury. And the person challenged shall be examined on oath and shall be required to answer on oath the lawful questions relating to the trial of the challenge. Let me explain what section 252 means. It means that if I say that I'm objecting to you, this member of the ju jury, because you, you are the landlord of the deceased person and you are likely to be prejudicial, or you've made some statements on air showing that you are prejudicial to the accused person, so you should be taken out. I have made that objection. Another person is opposing. The court must try that part of the case. We must call the jury that we called the juror, put him in the box, let him swear an oath that he's about to speak the truth and ask him, is it true that you are the landlord? Is it true that you made these statements? Is it true that you, are the you have a relationship with a deceased person? We have to examine your oath. And based on the answers you give, 
you shall not determine whether to exclude you or to maintain you. This will only happen when there's a challenge against a, a member of the jury and another party opposes that, my lord, this challenge has no basis. That one, the court must interrogate the truthfulness or otherwise. Because I saw that you, you are biased, you are prejudiced. The court must interrogate that particular prejudice I'm alleging against that particular juror. So section 252 deals with the trial of a challenge for cause. That the challenge for cause, if objected to by the opposite party, shall be tried and determined by the court without a jury. And the present challenge shall be examined on oath and shall be required to answer on oath the lawful questions relating to the trial of the challenge. There are some few points I wanted to note. That remember as a challenge for cause, if you look at what section 250 says, it says that an accused personally or by counsel shall be allowed to challenge three of the jurors by way of preemptive challenge without assigning a cause. So if you take a critical look at section 250 of that 30, a challenge for cause, a preemptive challenge is only available to the accused person. Then an accused personally or by counsel shall be allowed to challenge three of the jurors by way of preemptive challenge without assigning a cause. That one is available to the accused person. And there are a few points I wanted to note. That challenge for the preemptive challenge, preemptive challenge, under section 250, is available only to the accused. But a challenge for cause is open to both the accused and the prosecution. So take note, preemptive challenge is available only to the accused. A challenge for cause is available to both the prosecution and the accused. Next point I want you to note is that if the cause is established, if I say that you are the landlord of the deceased person, so you should be taken out, if we bring you on oath and it's established that indeed you are the landlord and you have a relationship with the deceased person and you are likely to be biased, the jury has to stand down. Stand down. You don't want people to be biased against the accused person. You want people who are fair. So stand down. As a duo. And as a matter of fact, remember I mentioned section 250, 252 of the Act 30. That says that a challenge for cause, if objected to by the opposite party, shall be tried and determined by the court, not the jury. So it is when I say that this person is a landlord, and other party opposes it, they're not a landlord. What if the landlord automatically admits it, that I'm the landlord? That there will be no need for a trial. If the cause is admitted by the duo. So the duo admits that, oh, it is true. I'm the landlord of this particular person. And I think that it will not be fair. There will be no need for that trial to determine whether we should admit the duo or not. There will be no need to now put the, that duo in the box and examine him on oath to ask him questions. If he admits it, let him stand out straight away so that you don't waste time. So please take note of what you mean by preemptive challenge under section 250 of the Act. It means that an accused personally or by counsel shall be allowed to challenge three of the jurors by way of preliminary challenge without assigning a cause. And take note of what you mean by challenge for cause, which is available to both the accused and the prosecution. If you have a legitimate basis for believing that one of the members of the jury is likely to be biased, you have a right to object. And once you object, the person will be taken out and must stand down. So, if we've gone through the preemptive challenge and we've gone through the challenge for cause, and now we have the full seven members of the jury, seven members, remember, seven members, people who are between the ages of 25 and 60 are residents in the public and can understand English. If you have the full seven now, what do we do next? What do we do next? after we have the full seven members to serve as jury. It is important to take note of section 249 of the 30. Section 249 of the 30 reads as follows, and I quote, 
when the jewels are ready to be sworn, the registrar or any other officer of the court shall address the accused person as follows. The jewels who are to try you are about to be sworn. If you object to any of them, you must do so as they come to the book to be sworn, and before they are sworn, and you shall be heard. So remember that the accused person, if he's there, because some people can come without a lawyer, the registrar must inform the accused person that he has the right to object to any of the members of the jury before they are sworn. This is what the law says that the registrar must say. That when the jurors are ready to be sworn, the registrar or any other officer of the court shall address the accused person as follows. The jurors who are ready to try you are about to be sworn. If you object to any of them, you must do so as they come to the book to be sworn. And before they are sworn, you shall be heard. So remember to object timelessly before they are sworn. And now the question that I asked, that if after now the jury, we have sworn all of them now, and we have the seven people to serve as jurors, what do we do next? Now they've all been sworn. We've gone through all the challenge phases, or maybe we don't challenge. So we have the full seven members to serve as jurors. What do we do next? What happens next in the case? Section 253 of the Act then kicks in. The jurors must appoint one of, the, one of them to be a foreman. So look at what section 253 of Act 30 says. That when the jewels have been chosen, they shall be sworn. When the jewels have been sworn, they shall appoint one of their number to be a foreman. When the jewels have been sworn, they shall appoint one of their number to be a foreman. So the seven member panel that was about the jury, they must appoint one of them to be a foreman. But what if they don't agree on who will be the foreman? The answer is in section 253, subsection 3, where a majority of the jury do not within the time that the court considered reasonable agree to the appointment of a foreman, the foreman shall be appointed by the court. Where a majority of the jury do not within the time that the court considers reasonable, agree to the appointment of a foreman, the foreman shall be appointed by the court. What is the duty of the foreman? Is under section 254 of the Act. The foreman shall preside at the meetings of the jury for consideration and ask information from the court that is required by the jury or any of the jurors. So while the case is ongoing, if the jury they want to ask any question, then it has to be asked by the foreman. And if the jury to retire and they have to consider anything at all, the foreman is the one that shall preside at the meetings of the jury. So now the accused has pleaded not guilty to the offense. Now, after accused has pleaded not guilty to the offense, the jury has been empaneled. After the jury has been empaneled, the case has been adjourned for case management conference. We are finished with our case management conference. We have now adjourned the case for the trial to begin. What do we see? Because now we have the jury. We have appointed the jury. We have a foreman. Look at what section 255 of the activity says. That the jury, having been sworn to give a true verdict according to the evidence on the issues to be tried by them, and having elected a foreman, the proper officer of the court shall inform them of the charge set forth in the indictment and of their duties as jurors on the trial. So now that the jurors have been empaneled, they've appointed their foreman, we must give the accused person in charge of the jury, because it's a jury that will determine the guilt or otherwise of the accused person. So under section 255 of the Act, when they have appointed their foreman now, the court will have to inform them. So it says that the jury having been sworn to give a true verdict according to the evidence on the issues to be tried by them and having elected a foreman the proper officer of the court shall inform them of the charge set forth in the indictment. 
So they'll tell you what chart we have against that his person. He's been bought by it for murder. He's been bought by it for rape. And we'll also inform you of the duties as jurors in the trial. And so, now that we have put the accused in charge of the jury, that now the accused, your fate lies in the hands of the jury. They will determine whether you'll be guilty or you'll not be guilty. What then happens next? I mean, now the case is set to begin. So at this point, what I want you to notice that is a trial on indictment. We've come to the high court. The jury have been empaneled. We've gone through the objection stage, preemptive challenge, challenge for cause. The jury have been empaneled. They have appointed their foreman. After appointing the foreman, the next thing is that we must hand over the accused in charge of the jury. So when you hand over the accused in charge of the jury, then it means the case is now set towards begin. So that the prosecution must now have to open their case. So under section 265 of the Act 30, the prosecution will have to open their case and then bring the evidence they have against the accused person. So opening of case for the prosecution, under section 265 of Act 30. So that in a trial before a justice with the aid of assessors, where the accused has pleaded to an indictment, or in a trial by jury, where the accused has been given in charge of the jury. So you see, it means that now the jury has already been empaneled and we have given the accused in charge of the jury. So section 265 of the attorney says, where the accused has been given in charge of the jury, counsel for the prosecution shall open the case against the accused and shall call witnesses and adduce evidence in support of the charge. Counsel for the accused, counsel for the prosecution shall open the case against the accused and shall call witnesses and adduce evidence in support of the child, of the charge. Because now the jury is ready, it's been empaneled. So prosecution, now the jurors are ready. Open your case, bring your witnesses. You said the accused person has committed murder. Call your witnesses and show us what they have all done. So, they must all testify on oath. Because under section 61 of the Evidence Act, before anybody testifies, you must wear the oath. You must wear the oath and indicate that you are swearing the oath to speak the truth. And under section 61 of the Evidence Act, if you don't swear the oath, whatever you say is not supposed to be evidence. So, Remember section 61 that you must all take give evidence on oath. Section 61 of the evidence act is very critical. And when prosecution calls all their witnesses, so prosecution will call their witnesses, and then their witnesses will give evidence in chief by telling us the case they have against the accused person. They will be cross-examined by the accused or the accused person's lawyer, and they may be re-examined if necessary. So for every witness the prosecution calls, they will swear the oath, testify, and then they shall give the evidence in chief, shall be cross-examined, and then they shall be re-examined if it is what's necessary. And then the juror may also ask for information through the foreman. And the judge may ask questions as well. So take note of this, that the accused, the prosecution will call their witnesses that will give their evidence in chief, meaning they'll tell us what case they have against with their version of the evidence against the accused person. They shall be cross examined by the accused person or the accused person's lawyer, and they shall be re examined if it is necessary. And the juror may ask for information to the foreman, or the judge may also ask questions. I want you to take note of something that is very critical in this particular process and it's under section 268 of the Act 30. The accused person, when the prosecution is calling their witnesses, has some rights available to him. And I want you to take note of that particular provision under section 268, subsection 1 of the Act 30. It reads as follows, and I quote, At any time before or during the course of the trial, the accused may, Required the police to deliver to the accused 
a copy of a statement taken by them from a person who is listed in the summary of evidence or in a supplementary summary or is actually called as a witness. So at any time or during the course of the trial, the accused can actually require the police to deliver to the accused a copy of the statement taken by them from a person who is listed in a summary of evidence or in a supplementary summary or is actually called as a witness. So, when a case person asks for that particular statement, take note of section 268 of section 2, that where a witness is cross-examined at the trial on behalf of the accused, on a part of the witness statement to the police, the prosecution may finish the course with a copy of the statement, and it shall become a part of the record of the trial. So I can ask the court to order you that the police bring a copy of the statement this person gave to you at the station. They now cross examine you on that particular statement. And then the act says that the statement shall not become evidence of the facts alleged. But the justice and the jury may take it into account in assessing the credibility of the witness or the witness evidence as a whole. And the prosecutions are also entitled to refer to it in cross examining a witness and in addressing the courts. So, for example, in your statement to the police, you said something. But now that you've come before the court, you are saying a different thing. I'm entitled by the law to ask for that statement so that I can cross examine you on it so, so that you, you are a very, somebody who's not credible. Why did you say this to the police when I was arrested? They are saying a different thing right now. I can call for the statement you give to the police and cross examine you on it. And under section 268, section 3, the court, the jury, may take it into account in assessing the credibility of the witness. And why, how come one person has said something to the police and has said a different thing before the courts? Prosecution, remember your job. That your job is that you must make sure you tender or you call all material witnesses in the case. Prosecution, don't leave anything out. Your duty as a prosecution, if you remember the case of R versus Asian, Alves Asian is reported in 1938 for West Africa West African Court of Appeals at page 112. That is the duty of the prosecution to call all material witnesses. So the prosecution, please do not leave anybody out. Any witness who is material, one whose evidence will help in deciding the case in one way or the other, please you must call that person as a witness. So prosecution, remember you must call all your material witnesses. Now, usually when the prosecution tenders all their calls all their witnesses, the last person to usually testify is the investigator. He's the one that would usually come and sum up everything that he did by way of investigation. It's not by force, but usually the last witness they call is the investigator. He will come and sum up everything that he did by way of investigation. And usually it's the investigator that will tender the investigation caution statement the accused person gives to the police and the child caution statement the accused gives to the police. Because when they arrested you, it's the investigator who conducted the investigation. He took all those statements from you. There's one critical step you should know over here. So, when you are an accused person, and then you are giving your statement to the police. Section 120 of the Evidence Act has a provision that governs what should be done when you are taking statements from such people. Every statement an accused person gives to the police must be given voluntarily. So when the investigator is about to tender the investigation caution statement, and it contains a confession of the accused person to the crime, and in the case of the accused person, that that statement wasn't taken voluntarily, you were tortured before you made a statement, or it wasn't taken in the presence of an independent witness. So you are saying what is there is not what you said. You have a right to object to that statement. And once you object to that statement, the court will have to conduct a separate trial to determine whether that statement is admissible or not. So, for example, 
one experience in a murder trial, the accused had given some statements to the police. And at that particular time, when they were arrested, because the police found some actions connecting them to the offense, they stripped them naked, they tortured them and things before they ended up giving, confessing to the crime. Because you know police, sometimes they've seen something small and they end up torturing you so that you confess to the crime. And so they, after they are torturing them, they confess to the crime in their statement they gave to the police. So now that they've come to the court, in fact, the statement they gave to the police, it is narrating how they carried out the offense of murder. But the truth of the matter is that this statement wasn't taken voluntarily. It wasn't taken voluntarily. So what should happen in a case like this? The accused can object to the admissibility of the statement. And when you object, we must conduct a trial to determine the admissibility of it. But I want you to advert your mind to something. The jury, we must not let them see what is in that statement. So, because if they see what's in the statement, it may prejudice their mind. So when you're going to conduct a separate trial to determine the admissibility of this statement, the jury will not be present. It will only be the judge, the prosecution, and the accused. So that because the statement will be read out, then the accused will object to it and say that I didn't make it voluntarily. Assuming the objection of the accused is upheld, it means the statement will not be admissible. They will call by the jury to continue with the trial. You see, the reason why you must exclude the jury is because if they are there and they hear it, even though it may not be admitted, they've already heard it. They've gone into their head. It may, it may, it may prejudice their mind against how they'll treat the accused person. So when the investigator objects, when, when the accused person objects to the admissibility of these statements, then we must conduct what you call a mini trial or a trial voir dire, where the court will determine whether to admit that evidence or not. Because the confession statement must be obtained in compliance with Section 120 of the Evidence Act. If not obtained in compliance with Section 120, it will be inadmissible. So remember, at this stage, we are at the stage where the prosecution is calling all their witnesses. And we've said that on the authority of R and ACM, it's the duty of the prosecution to call all material witnesses. And a material witness is one whose evidence will help in deciding the case in one way or the other. And then usually the last witness to be called by the prosecution is the investigator. And the investigator is the one who can and tender the witness, the investigation caution statement that he took from the accused person. And if he's tendering it, and then it contains a confession, and the accused thinks that that confession wasn't made voluntarily, the accused can object to that particular statement. And when you object, the court will have to conduct a mini trial to determine the admissibility or otherwise of the statement. The next thing I want you to note is that if the prosecution calls all their witnesses, but the attorney general is of the opinion that there are some other people that they intend to call. Let us see what section 266 of the Act 30 says. Section 266 of the Act 30 reads as follows, and I quote, Where the Attorney General is of the opinion that there is in a case committed for a trial, a material or necessary witness other than those mentioned in the summary of evidence, the Attorney General may call the witness before the trial courts on giving to the registrar of the court and to the accused notice of the intention to call the witness before the trial courts together with the summary of evidence to be given by the witness. This is a very important provision. You remember under trial and indictment, at the committal stage, the accused will be served with a copy of the summary of evidence to be given by every witness that they intend to call at the trial. So usually the accused already knows that you're going to call six witnesses to utter the summary of what they are all, all coming to see. 
But sometimes the attorney general may finish calling their witnesses and they're realizing that there is a material witness other than the one that has been mentioned in the summary of evidence. Then the law is saying that where the attorney general is of the opinion that there is in the case committed for trial a material or necessary witness other than those mentioned in the summary of evidence, the attorney general may call the witness before the trial court on giving the register of the court into that his notice of the intention to call the witness before the trial court, together with a summary of the evidence to be given by that witness. So this is an important provision because we've been already taught that to kickstart the trial and indictment process, there has to be a bill of indictment and summary of evidence. And all of that were even done at the committal stage. So at the committal stage, the accused person already knows that they are going to call seven witnesses. And he had a summary of the evidence. And now you want to call an additional person. The law gives attorney general the right to call an additional evidence under section 266 of the Act 30. So section 269 also deals with the statutory statements. Remember that at the committal stage, there was a particular statement we refer to as the statutory statement that was taken from the accused person, which was recorded in writing. 269 says that the statement of the accused duly recorded by or before the committing court, and whether signed by the accused or not, may be given in evidence without further proof of the statement by the prosecution, unless it is proved that the magistrate purporting to sign it did not in fact sign it. So please take note, that statutory statement that was taken at the committal stage, that statement too may be tendered in evidence. But if the magistrate didn't sign it, that one, the court will not allow it. So it says that the statement of the accused, duly recorded by or before the committing courts, and whether signed by the accused person or not, may be given in evidence without further proof of the statement by the prosecution unless it is proved that the magistrate purporting to sign it did not in fact sign it. That is the import of section 269 of the Act 30. Then 269 of section 2. Now, where the prosecution does not put in the statement, the justice on the application of the defense may order the statement to be read at the conclusion of the prosecution evidence as part of the prosecution's case. So, assuming you know that you have given a statement to the district courts, the statutory statement, but when the prosecution called all their witnesses and were giving the evidence, they didn't tender that one. 269 2 says that as an accused person, you can apply to the courts that the statement should be read out as part of the evidence of the prosecution's case. So he says that's where the prosecution does not put in the statement. The justice on the application of the of the defense. So on the application of the defense, so the defense can apply, may order the statement to be read at the conclusion of the prosecution evidence as part of the prosecution case. So after going through all of this, what we are supposed to note is that after the prosecution has called all their witnesses, the judge can also call a witness if he thinks this witness is necessary. Maybe after you all testified, you were all mentioning that there was this particular person, this particular person who was there, who was there, but that person has not been called. The judge might be curious and say that this person should be ordered to come and testify so that I will see what he has to see because you must prove beyond reasonable doubt. And remember, there's a burden on the prosecution to call all material evidence, all material witnesses. So, if necessary, the judge may call witnesses. It is prudent for the prosecution to inform the court that it intends to close its case. So after the prosecution has given some notice, 
the prosecution shall inquire from the court whether the court wants to call a witness to clarify an issue and that the prosecution will require the judge to call that witness before the prosecution closes its case. So usually the prosecution, when you call your witnesses, you should find out from the judge that we intend to close our case. Do you intend to call any witness before we close our case? It is important. Please, this is a very critical stage. It is important, very critical, that you, the prosecution, always remember this. You must give the judge notice that we, are not, we intend to close our case. Is there any witness that the court intends to call? If yes, then we want you to call the witness before we close our case. And let me tell you the reason. If the prosecution closes their case, you've closed your case by calling all your witnesses. You said you finished and you're going. Before the judge is not coming to call the witness, it means that the judge has some doubt in his mind. And if there's, if there's any doubt in the judge's mind, it must be resolved in favor of the accused person. The accused must be acquitted and discharged. Think about it carefully. Prosecution, you finish closing your case. And then, the judge is not coming to court a witness to clarify. It means that the judge has some doubt. If you have some doubt, please, it must be resolved in favor of the accused person. So, it is good that you rather inform the court that you intend to close your case. So that the court has an intention of calling any witness, it will call the witness before you close your case. So that is the import of the case of Mali versus the States, reported in 1965, Ghana Law Report at page 710. If you read this case, it's a decision of the Supreme Court and you read the whole form. This is what you see over there, and I quote. Where at the end of the prosecution's case, the court requires further evidence to enable it to decide issues raised in the evidence given by the prosecution, then the irresistible inference is that the prosecution has not made out a case and the accused should be acquitted. Again, where at the end of the prosecution's case, the court requires further evidence to enable us to decide issues raised in the evidence given by the prosecution, then the irresistible inference is that the prosecution has not made out a case and the accused should be acquitted. So, after the close of the prosecution's case, if you want to amend the charge sheets, I mean, they can amend the charge sheet, especially before they close their case. So, section 26, 271 of the Acts 30 says as follows. That the justice may consider at the conclusion of the case of the prosecution whether there is a submission whether there is a case for submission to the jury. And if of the opinion that a case has not been made, that the accused has committed an offense of which the accused could be lawfully convicted, and the indictment on which the accused is being tried, the justice shall direct the jury to enter a verdict of not guilty and shall acquit the accused person. So this is what we call the submission of no case to answer under trial on indictments. That if after the case has gone on, the prosecution has called all your witnesses, and then the court is of the opinion that there's no case for submission to the jury, then the court must acquit and discharge the accused person. So the court shall direct the jury to enter a verdict of not guilty and shall acquit the accused person. So, for example, if after you have called all your witnesses, it is clear that you've not established a salient element of the offense. Remember the elements of submission of no case to answer, state and Ali Kasana, that maybe your witnesses have been heavily been discredited and across examination. Or you feel to establish a material element of the offense. And there's no need for the accused to answer. The court can say that at this point, a jury enter a verdict of not guilty. Do not even let the accused come and say anything because. If you look at the evidence of the prosecution, they do not make out any case against the accused. So acquit and discharge the accused person. This is the end of the first part of the trial of indictments. When I say end of the first part, this is what I mean. This is the end of the case for the prosecution. So the first part is that accused is not guilty. 
the jury is empaneled, you go through the challenges, they appoint their foreman, you hand over the accused in charge of the jury. Now the prosecution must open their case. When the prosecution opens their case, then they will call all their witnesses. They may end up calling the investigator as the last person. Then there could be a mini trial. When there's a mini trial or not, the mini trial must be conducted in the absence of the jury. When you come back, you let us know whether you have any additional witness to call. And then at the end of the day, tell the court that you intend to close your case, whether the court intends to call a witness. If the court has a witness to call, you may call that particular witness. After the witness has been called, what happens? Then you can now close your case. If you close your case, we now have to find out whether there's also a case for the accused person to answer. So the accused may make a submission of no case to answer, or it may be considered by the judge himself. So this is the end of the first part of the case. The second part of the case is that assuming the submission of no case is upheld, the accused is going to be acquitted and discharged. But if the submission of no case is refused, then you are supposed to deal with the case for the defense. If it is refused, it means that the case for the accused person to answer. So the accused must come forward and then also call his witnesses. So under section 272 of the Act 30, if it is a case for the accused person to answer, the judge must inform the accused of the rights available to the accused person. What does section 272 of the Act 30 say? And I read. At the close of the evidence for the prosecution, and after the statement of the accused before the committing court has been given in evidence, the trial court shall, in cases where the accused is not defended by counsel, inform the accused, A, of the right to address the court, B, on the right to give evidence on the accused's own behalf, or to make an unsworn statement. So, at the close of the evidence of the prosecution, and after the statement of the accused before the committing court has been given in evidence, the trial court shall, in cases where the accused is not defended by counsel, inform the accused of the rights of the accused to address the courts. And also on the rights to give evidence on the accused's own behalf or to make an unsworn statement. Or C, of the rights of the accused to call witness in defense of the accused and it shall require the accused or counsel of the accused to state whether it is intended to call witnesses as to facts other than the accused. So if you know that you are going to call witnesses apart from the accused person too, you must inform the courts. On the accused being so informed, the judge shall record the facts and shall observe the procedure in section 273. So section 273, it reads as follows. So, take note of section 272, that says that on the accused being so informed, the justice shall record the facts and shall then observe the procedure set out in section 273. So what is the procedure in section 273? It reads as follows. Where the accused is not defended by counsel and states the intention not to call a witness as to facts, The court shall give the court shall call on the accused to make a statement or say nothing or give evidence on oath 
as to the facts. And after cross-examination of the witness, the accused shall be permitted to address the courts and to call any witnesses as to character. So where the accused is not defended by counsel and still the intention not to call a witness as to facts, the court shall call on the accused to make a statement or to say nothing or to give evidence on oath as to the facts. And after cross-examination of the witness, the accused shall be permitted to address the courts and to call any witnesses as to character. So this is when the accused is not defended by counsel. The court shall call on the accused to make a statement or say nothing or give evidence on oath as to the facts. And after cross-examination of the witness, the accused shall be permitted to address the courts and to call any witnesses as to character. Subsection 2. Where the accused is not defended by counsel but states the intention to call other witnesses, the court shall call upon the accused to open the accused case. So where the accused is not defended by counsel, but says the intention to call other witnesses, the court shall call upon the accused to open the accused case. Then three, at the conclusion of the evidence for the defense, the accused shall be permitted to sum up the case of the accused to the court, and counsel for the prosecution is entitled to reply. So it means that where the accused is not defended by counsel but state the intention to call other witnesses, the court shall call upon the accused to open the accused case. So by opening the accused case, you also call your witnesses, you whether you want to testify, you all give the evidence in chief, they may be cross-examined and they may be re-examined. At the conclusion of the evidence of the defense, when you've accused, you've called all your witnesses. You, the accused, you shall be allowed to sum up the case of the accused to the courts. And then the prosecution shall respond. By way of a reply. So, this applies when the accused person is not defended by counsel under section 273. Please take note of the procedure. In 273 over 13. That's the procedure you follow when the accused is not defended by counsel. If the accused is not defended by counsel and states his intention not to call a witness as to fact, the court shall call on the accused to make a statement or say nothing or give evidence on oath as to the facts. And after cross examination of the witness, the accused shall be permitted to address the court and call any witness as to character. When the accused is not defended by counsel, but states the intention to call other witnesses, the court shall call upon the accused to open the accused case by calling their witnesses, they come and give the evidence, evidence in chief, causes, they will be cross-examined, they may be re-examined. After the close of the evidence of the defense, the accused shall be permitted to sum up the case of the, of the accused and to, to the courts, and counsel for the prosecution is entitled to reply. So this is the procedure we follow when the accused is not defended. What if the accused is defended? Section 274 of Act 13. Where the accused is defended by counsel, who states that a witness as to the facts will not be called except the accused? So it means that the only person you are calling is the accused. The court shall require the accused to make an unsworn statement or give evidence and subsequently counsel for the prosecution may address the courts and counsel for the defense may reply and shall then call the witness as to the character of the accused. This is a section that you should critically analyze. It gives a lot of information. And I'll read it three times and explain it. Where the accused is defended by counsel, who states that a witness as to the facts will not be called except the accused. 
the court shall require the accused to make an unsworn statement. So it's giving you what options are available to the accused, even when the accused is represented by a lawyer. The court shall require the accused to make an unsworn statement or give evidence, and subsequently, counsel for the prosecution may address the court. So you see, if it's only the accused you are calling, and the accused testifies without a witness, then the person to address the court first will be the prosecution. So look, look at take a critical look at it. When the accused is defended by counsel, who state that a witness as to the facts will not be called except the accused, meaning the only person they are calling is the accused. The court shall require the accused to make an unsworn statement or give evidence, and subsequently, the prosecution may address the court and counsel for the defense may reply. And shall then call a witness as to the character of the accused. I want you to take note of this. Look at who is replying first. This one, the address is being done first by the prosecution because the accused didn't call any witness apart from the accused. So if you had an accused person standing the trial, you are the only one that, has, that, that came to testify. No other person came to give evidence in support of you. Only you the accused. That one, the prosecution speaks, addresses first, and the defense may reply. Now look at section 274, subsection 2. Where the accused is defended by counsel, who's the intention to call witnesses other than the accused? What happens? 274, subsection 2 says that where the accused is defended by counsel, who states the intention to call witnesses other than the accused? The court shall call on the accused counsel to open the case. And at the conclusion of the evidence for the defense, counsel for the accused may address the courts and counsel for the prosecution may reply. You must take note of what is happening over here, that when the accused is defended by counsel and he says the intent to call witnesses apart from the accused, then in that instance, the court shall call on the accused counsel to open the case. When the accused counsel opens the case and they conclude the evidence of the accused by calling the accused and all the other witnesses, counsel for the accused at that point may address the courts. First, and then the counsel for the prosecution may reply. So I, I hope by now you're seeing the difference. Look at the first one, 274 subsection 1. When the accused is defended by counsel, who says that and the witness as to the facts will not be called, apart from the accused? Then the court shall require the accused to make an unsworn statement or give evidence, and subsequently the prosecution may address the court. So when the accused is the only one who testifies, Without any other witness, the first person to address the court is the prosecution. But when the accused is defended by counsel, and he mentions that he will call witnesses apart from the accused, the first person to address the court after the conclusion of the evidence shall be counsel for the accused. And after that, the prosecution may reply. But it is important to note that as part of the options available to the accused person, the accused can also decide to remain silent. The accused shall decide to remain what? Silent. So, it is a fundamental right available to the accused that you can appear there and say that you don't want to even see anything and it's a fundamental right under article 19 of the constitution remember article 19 clause 10 it reads that no person who is tried for a criminal offense shall be compelled to give evidence at the trial so if the accused person is caught he can decide to remain quiet and not say anything and nobody can compel the accused person to give evidence at the trial So, that is another right option available to the accused person. Now, what if the accused person too intends to call additional witnesses? Section 275 of the Act 13 is over there. It reads as follows, that the accused shall be allowed to examine the witness, although not previously called, although not previously bound over to give evidence, 
and it's that truth is of understanding, understanding that the witness will not attend the trial voluntarily. The accused is entitled to apply for the issue of process to compel the witness's attendance. So let's say accused, you finish calling all your witnesses, and then so the accused finished calling all their witnesses and they realize that no, there's a material witness that I have to call. And this particular person is even refusing to even come. And he's the one that is, will come and show the cause that I'm indeed innocent, but he's refusing to come. Then the accused can inform the court and the court can issue a process to compel the attendance of the witness. So an accused shall be allowed to examine the witness, although not previously bound over to give evidence. And if the accused is of the understanding that the witness will not attend the trial voluntarily, the accused is entitled to apply for the issuance of a process to compel the witness's attendance. And remember that an accused is not entitled to an adjournment to secure the attendance of the witness unless the accused shows that by reasonable diligence, any last steps have been taken that could not obtain the attendance of that witness. So remember that after the accused has called all their witnesses and there's a witness that they have not already mentioned that they will call, the law allows the accused person to call that particular witness. If the witness is refusing to attend court, the accused can inform the court and the court can issue a process that will compel the attendance of that particular witness. Beyond that point, at the close of the evidence of the defense, take note of section 276 of Act 30, which reads as follows, that at the close of the evidence for the defense, or where it is sought to rebut evidence of good character, after evidence of good character has been given, the court may on the application of counsel for the prosecution, grant counsel leave to call evidence to disprove new facts set up by the defense. So at the close of the evidence for the defense, where it is sought to rebut evidence of good character, after evidence of good character has been given, the court may, on the application of counsel for the prosecution, grant counsel leave to call evidence to prove new facts set up by the defense. So maybe it's an, it's an offense of rape. And then you want to call evidence that you are a priest, you are a deacon, and you are a person of good character and things. So you call people that can testify as to the character of you, the accused person. In this instance, even though you finish calling all your witnesses and close your case, the law allows the prosecution to apply to the court to call evidence to come and rebut that evidence of good character. That even though you are a deacon, there's evidence to show that you've been harassing young girls in the church. So the law is that. At the close of the evidence of the accused person, if the accused has called an evidence of good character, the prosecution can return. They can return to the court and tell the court that, my Lord, they have called evidence of good character. Ordinarily, we've closed our case. But because they brought evidence of good character, we should be allowed to call evidence to rebut that evidence of good character they are given. That's section 276 of Act 30. Now, where the evidence in rebuttal is given, counsel for the defense is entitled to comment on the evidence so given. So, remember that ideally, when prosecution closes their case, they are not allowed to come and call any evidence again. But when you are accused, you come and testify, but you call evidence of good character, the law allows the prosecution under Section 276 to call evidence to rebut that evidence of good character. Now take notes that when the defense has called all the witnesses that it intends to call in support of this case, the defense will have to close their case. So this is the second stage of the trial on indictment that the accused person to remember the prosecution called all their witnesses, they closed their case, Accused to you've come, you've called all your witnesses to, you've also closed your case. What then is the next thing? Is for the parties to now file their addresses or to address the courts. Because remember, the jury are there. They are there and then they are ready 
to hear everything that you've done in the whole case. So, accused person, if you called witnesses, you must now come and address the court. Tell the court that they brought you here for murder. Look at all the evidence they brought. All the witnesses have come to discredit themselves. They are inconsistent. They've not been able to show they're saving a dead body. And this is what the law says about murder. So you are innocent. Address the court on the facts, the law, and then the words evidence. Address the court. So that the prosecution to also address the court on the facts, evidence, and the law. So this will enable the judge to know how to even sum up the law and the evidence to the jury. So, addresses by parties. It is to enable the parties to present to the judge and the jury the facts which have been established or disproved. It also enables the parties to make any submissions of law and generally to argue all points which, in the considered opinion of the parties, should affect the determination of the case. But remember the question, who addresses first? Who addresses first? I've mentioned it already. If you were listening, I mentioned that when the accused person calls witnesses apart from the accused person, then the accused person's lawyer will address the court first, and then after that, the prosecution will end up what? Responding. Remember section 274 of the Act 30, subsection 2. Now, where the accused is defended by counsel who states the intention to call witnesses other than the accused, the court shall call on the accused counsel to open the case. And at the conclusion of the case for the defense, counsel for the accused may address the court. And the counsel for the prosecution may reply. So if now I'm asking that for the addresses, who files the address, who addresses the court first, remember that after the close of the defense case, who will address the court first will depend on whether the accused person called witnesses apart from the accused. If the accused called witnesses, apart from the accused himself, then generally the accused is the one who address first, and as the prosecution may respond. But if the accused was the only one who testified, then that's one the courts can decide that. Then that one, the prosecution may address the court first before the accused too will come in. This provision about the address is very important. And so let me refer to the learned author, Justice Dennis Dominica J. in his book, The Criminal Procedure and Practice in Ghana, at page 371, so that you really appreciate the order in which we have to file the addresses. This is what the learned author says at page 371 of his book. After the close of hearing, the court may invite counsel for the parties to address the courts. When accused do not call evidence, the prosecution shall address the court and may be replied by the accused, and the prosecution may have the right of final reply. I'm taking that portion again. When accused did not call evidence, the prosecution shall address the court and may be replied by the accused, and the prosecution may have the right of final reply. When accused called evidence, the accused shall address the courts and shall be replied by the prosecution. The jurors do not retire during the address. So you see, this is for the hierarchy or the order in which we may find the addresses. So after we have now filed our addresses, it means that we are done with the second stage. So with the first stage, maybe the prosecution calls their case, um, they open that case, they close it. Um, accused two will come and open that case, so they've closed it. Now, the third stage, that after, the third stage is the addresses. Now, they file the addresses after they've all closed their case. That's the second stage, they file the addresses. Third stage, what happens after the addresses? There's something we call summing up by the justice. At this point, the accused they have addressed the jury on why they think they are innocent. The prosecution shall also address the court on why they think the accused person is guilty. The judge must now have a duty to discharge, which is sum up the law and the evidence to the jury. Look at section 277 of the Act. When 
it reads as follows. When in a trial before a jury, the case on both sides is closed, the justice shall, if necessary, sum up the law and the evidence in the case. The justice shall sum up the law and the evidence in the case. So that it's the duty of the judge at this point to sum up the law and the evidence in the case. Because the jurors are ordinary people who are just people between 25 and 60 years and they can only speak English. They don't know what the law is about. So the rule of the judge is to sum up the law and the evidence to the jury as required by section 277 of the Act. Now section 280 of the Act. After the summing up, the jury shall consider their verdict. And for that purpose, they may retire. So now, after summing up, the jurors have to now retire and go into their small room, their foreman will preside, and they should now consider their verdict. When they go, no other person is supposed to go and speak with the jury when they are considering their verdict. If you want to go and speak to them, you must seek permission of the court. So section 280, sub section 2 says that, except with leave of the court, a person other than the juror shall not speak to or hold a communication with a member of the jury while the jury are considering their verdict. So after the summing up, the ju jury shall consider their verdict and for that purpose, they may retire. 281, section 281 of authority. When the jury have considered their verdict and they retire, then they have to come back and announce their verdict to the court. So when the jurors return, they ask them, jurors, do you have a verdict? Usually the clerk will ask them, do you have a verdict? And then the foreman will answer, either yes or no. And when they answer, they ask them, is your verdict unanimous? They will answer yes or no. That's how it is. So section 281 is what deals with that. When the jury have considered their verdict, the foreman shall inform the justice what is their verdict or that they are not unanimous. Remember, this is a capital offense. It carries the death penalty. Section 2A2 of Act 30. When the jury are not unanimous, the justice may require them to retire for further consideration. Because it must be unanimous because you must prove beyond reasonable doubt. If some of you are not in agreement, it means that there's some doubt somewhere. You must go back and go and check. So where the jury are not unanimous, the justice may require them to retire for further consideration. And after a period that the justice considered reasonable, the jury may deliver their verdict or state that they are not unanimous. You see, you must prove beyond reasonable doubt that the accused person is guilty. So if in this case, you are saying that you are not unanimous, it means some of you are in doubt. And if you are in doubt, the accused must walk and go home free. The free person. So, what is the implication if it's not unanimous? Let's go to section 285 of the Act 30. When the jury are unanimous in their opinion, subsection 1, the justice shall give judgment in accordance with their verdict. Where the accused is found not guilty, the justice shall record a judgment of acquittal. Where the accused is found guilty, the justice shall pass sentence on the accused according to law. Let me explain this portion. When the accused is found not guilty, so it is a jury that are determining that the accused is guilty or not. So when the jury decides that the accused is guilty, that one, the judge must pass sentence according to the judge. You don't have a discretion. Once they are guilty, you, you must pass the sentence. If it is murder and they say it's guilty, straight away, the judge, you must pass the death sentence straight away. Because section 46 of Act 29 says that a person who commits murder shall be liable to suffer death. So when the accused is found guilty, the justice shall pass sentence according to law. But what if the, people, the jury, they are not unanimous? Look at section 285, subsection 4. When the jury are not unanimous in their opinion, the justice shall after the lapse of a time that the justice considers reasonable, discharge the jury. Where the jury are not unanimous in their opinion, the justice shall, after the lapse of time that the justice considers reasonable, discharge the jury. Again, where the jury are not unanimous in their opinion, the justice shall, after the lapse of time 
that the justice considers reasonable the child a jury. But a verdict of a majority of not less than five to two shall, in respect of an offence which is not punishable by death, be held, taken to be, and received by the court as the verdict of the whole jury. So a verdict of a majority of not less than five to two shall, in respect of an offence which is not punishable by death, be held, taken to be, and received by the court as the verdict of the whole jury. So there are some offences that are troubled on indictment, but are not punishable by death, like manslaughter. Or like robbery, it can be tried on indictment, but it's not punishable by death. So, if an accused person is tried on indictment, for an offence which is not punishable by death, the law is saying that a verdict of a majority of not less than 5 to 2, so either 6 1 or 5 2, it shall be received by the court at the verdict of the whole jury. But if it is 4-3, that's one, the jury must be discharged. When the jury is discharged, the accused shall be detained in custody or released on bail and shall be tried by another jury. That is in 2-8-6 over 30. And then 2 8 3 over 30, verdict on this charge. Unless otherwise ordered by the court, the jury shall return a verdict on the charges on which the accused is tried. And the justice may ask them questions that are necessary to ascertain what their verdict is. The questions and the answers shall be recorded. Sometimes you charge you for multiple offenses. Each charge, we shall ask you what you are pleading for. Where by an accident or mistake, a wrong verdict is delivered, the jury may before or immediately after it is recorded, amend the verdict, and it shall stand as ultimately amended. So this is what brings us to the full process of trial by judge and then a jury. It's a very long process, but it's very simple to summarize. It's very detailed because we have to afford everything to the accused person to make sure that because the punishment of the accused person can be a very severe punishment. So by way of a recap, it is important that at least you know that trial by indictment, by judge and jury, we must take note of all the stages that we follow. It's very simple if you actually visualize it. But first of all, when you come to the trial court, we take your plea. When we take your plea and you plead not guilty, before the court will adjourn according to the party's direction, they must empanel the jury before the case adjourned for case management conference. After case management conference, the case will definitely have to adjourn for the trial to begin. By that point, remember that when you empanel the jury, Remember that each of them must be sworn. Remember the rights open to the accused person to object to each of them. Remember preemptive challenge. Remember challenge for cause. Preemptive challenge. You can challenge a maximum of three people without giving a reason. Challenge for cause. You must give a reason. And the reasons are in the act. When we come back to the court and the jury has been formed, we hand over the accused in charge of the, of the jury. It's not accused. The jurors are the ones that will not determine your guilt. So after that, the prosecution will have to open their case. They'll call all their swear the oath and attach the one, and they call all their witnesses. They'll give the evidence in chief. They'll be cross-examined. They'll be re-examined. Usually, the last person they'll call will be the investigator, who shall then tender the statements the accused gave to the police. If the statements contain a confession, the accused can object to the admissibility. They will conduct a mini trial. But the mini trial is supposed to be conducted in the absence of the jury. We go through all that process about the prosecution calling additional evidence and things, and they must inform the court that they intend to close their case. Remember, because of Mali versus the state. So that if the court intends to call the witness, the court can call the witness before they close their case. If they close their case, then the court may consider whether there's a case for the accused person to answer. 
if there's a case for the accused person to answer, the court shall allow the accused person to now open his case. But if there's no case for the accused person to answer, he shall acquit and discharge the accused person. Accused person too, if you open your case, you have a right to remain silent, make an unsworn statement, give evidence on oath, who will inform you of your options. Remember the distinction between the options available to the accused when it's defended by counsel and when it's not defended by counsel. So if the accused decides to give evidence, remember that he can give evidence alone or call witnesses in support. Do all go through the same process, evidence in chief, cross examination and a re-examination. They will go through the process. After that, the accused can also call additional witness. You can ask the registrar, serve someone on this person to come and testify. After that, they close their case. When they close their case, next thing is for us, addresses. How do we do the addresses? Look at the order. If the accused called witnesses, apart from the accused himself, then usually the accused will be the one that addressed the court first. But if the accused was the only person who testified, the prosecution addresses first, then the accused will respond after that. But I want you to remember that the Attorney General always has the right of final reply. After addresses, what next? It must be done in the presence of the jury. After addresses, the judge must not sum up the law and the evidence to the jury. Because the jury, they don't know any law. The judge will sum up the law and the evidence to them. They should now retire and go and consider their verdict. When they retire and they come back, the foreman will have to inform the court on whether they have a verdict. If they inform the court, that they are unanimous that the accused person is guilty, the court must pass sentence according to law. If it's death sentence, the court must pass sentence. I hereby sentence you to death by hanging or by firing squad, that you'll be shot with a gun till you die. The court is supposed to pass the sentence. But if they return and they are not unanimous in the verdict, and it's a capital offense like murder, and they are not unanimous, it means that there's a doubt that one the accused must be allowed to go. But remember that if it's an offense that is not punishable by death, like manslaughter, which you can get a life sentence for, remember that a verdict of no less than 5 to 2 shall be considered a verdict of the whole jury. So it's a simple process if you visualize it. So this will be the end of the procedure on trial on indictment. It is good to go over the lecture over and over again to master all the viewer stages because it's a very elaborate procedure. This is the end of our lecture on trial on indictments in Ghana by judge and jury. Thank you.